fear that ultimately drove me into the realms of the darkness, and it was the love of God that pulled me out. Hey, you guys, we have another exciting episode of the Unrefined Podcast, and this one, you guys, is going to be unrefined indeed. Uh, Lindsay is here in the house. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, guys. Glad to finally get BT here, and let's dive in. Yeah. Yep. And uh, BT is a personal friend, Brandon Wallace, but we're going to call him BT for expediency's sake because I'm Brandon too, but also that's his writer name he is a writer and i'll let him tell you all the other stuff he he does because he is a renaissance man if i've ever seen one so uh how you doing bt glad to have you here today doing well thanks for the invite yeah well, we're honored seriously to have uh, your input because you are a as my little son just introduced me to which i knew the word a plethora of knowledge and we can't <laughs> wait to extract this knowledge from you today Tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what you're up to right now. And then we'll, we, we want to hear your journey and your testimony, if that's okay. Absolutely. That sounds great. I've been doing freelance writing for a while. I'm self-published. I write, like you said, under the name BT Wallace on Amazon.com. I do historical noir and psychological horror as the theme. I've got other things in the works. I'm trying to do some Western and some fantasy writing as well. Mm. And in the works, I'm currently working on a podcast of my own, thanks to Brandon here. And Sandy. And, and Sandy. You, know, you yep. have to mention Sandy because she's, right. she's the brains behind this. She really is. Yes, yeah, Lindsay. Yep. Yeah. Um, I concur. Yeah. I mean, she makes us look good, and she's going to make you look good, too. So um, well, let me ask you this. We're going to talk about some of your early, uh, not really childhood, but I guess more teenage, younger adult years and your experience in the occult. That's that's primarily why we wanted you on there. And then we want you know, the victory story of how you came out of it and all that kind of stuff. Can you kind of give us a beginning of your journey of, of what led you into that type of thing and... Um, Feel free to be as vulnerable and authentic as you want to be. You know, it's up to you what you will. Okay? Absolutely. Sounds good. So, a lot of individuals can relate to this. I was brought up going to church by my grandmother. My mother worked full-time. And that meant usually the weekend evenings I'd be at my grandmother's house. And when you're there, you go to church. We would go to various evangelical-themed churches over the years, from a four-square to something more non-denominational. And through, throughout that time, it was important to my grandma that we read our Bibles, that we prayed to Jesus, and that we accepted Him in our heart as our personal Lord and Savior. All the, all the atypical evangelical world things. And she taught me that there was an importance in following Jesus and loving Jesus and loving people. About the time I was 15, she had decided to divorce her then second husband over things and issues that are, that are personal, and I don't get into those. However, it, it shook my worldview because here's somebody who believes that you are supposed to work through any problems however you can with all your strength. And I saw this not happening. Ultimately, I decided to walk away from Christianity. And doing so, I, I adopted more of an agnostic worldview that is, sure, there's God, but he doesn't really care about any of us. And after that, I began hanging out with the goth crowd at high school. I found them pretty accepting individuals. And we would hang out and we'd talk. And a couple of the guys were into uh, tarot cards and horoscope and et cetera. And I began looking into those things on my own as well. 
And over time, my agnosticism grew into a acceptance of the, the Wiccan worldview that's the magical system invented by this guy named Gerard Gardner back in the 30s, 40s. And that meant accepting some kind of pagan deity as my personal deity or deities, not pantheistic worldview. And I practiced candle magic and a handful of things associated with Wicca. Hey, BT, what, what, can you tell the audience real quick, what do you mean by pan, pantheistic uh, worldview? What, can you define that for them? Oh, sure. So, uh, so pantheism is, is, is a belief that says everything in the universe is part of a divine or godlike being. It's okay. like saying God isn't separate, isn't a separate, all-powerful pers- all person in the sky, but instead God is the whole universe itself. So in pantheism, nature, the stars, you, everything are all connected to this divine presence. It's a way of seeing the world as sacred and interconnected. And is, that like do... what, is that like what a lot of New Age people believe? Are they pantheists? Pantheistic? One of the downsides of being in the pagan world is it's super subjective, mm. very subjective, which means it's a each person, if you're going to have a million pagans, you're going to have a million different definitions on that question. Mm-hmm. And, and that's most likely, a, it's most likely a follow because it's modern. It's a modernist. Yeah. And so it's very individualistic. It's you know, the American dream, really, in a religious out- outlook. Hmm. Very postmodern, I guess, in, this, in the sense of the kind of choose your own religion. So the, like yeah. the books we had when we were kids, choose your own adventure. Like choose your own religion. Yeah, and in, in, in Wicca, it's a it's a buffet style paganism. Honest, you're gonna mm-hmm. find people who are earth based. You'll find people who are elemental based. And what I mean is, is earth based is people who find God in nature, or their God in nature, or the deity in nature. And then a person who's elemental in focus will focus upon, say water spirits or fire spirits or earth spirits and interact with everything associated with a particular element. Yeah, Mm. we talked about elementals a lot when we did the little people episode because a lot of the little people are sort of elemental type beings in a lot of the mythology and folklore. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, particularly the sense... South American ones. Anyway, go ahead, BT. Yeah, you find gnomes. In, in that particular pagan view, uh, a gnome is an earth spirit. Uh, uh, a, a zephyr is an air spirit. A sylph is a water spirit. Yeah, and maybe a djinn is a fire spirit, just to give a mm. simple... What would a sprite be? Is it, would, would a sprite be a... Um... I think sprites are another word for tiny fairy. Okay. Okay. The Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell's a tiny fairy. Yeah. And the Fae are an entirely different cryptid, I guess. They, right. Yeah, I'm not, not too familiar with that, but yeah, interesting. And, and so in my walk, I had been talking to, you know, I started paying more attention in school in philosophy class or history class. Mm. And I had a really good history teacher that was, that could teach boring, American history in an entirely entertaining way. And I believe that is a rare, rare skill to be able to engage people with history. Yeah. And he was very big on philosophy and the development of the American uh, experiment, call it the American experiment, that being the idea of America being a philosophical experiment, and democracy, republic, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And this philosophy idea struck me, and I began looking into uh, Plato, Aristotle, all the way to the newer ones of, of Nietzsche or, or Jung, and this began to shape my worldview. Now, mind you, I'm still a teenager, I'm still young, and I don't have the mental ability to, to 
correlate all of the ideas that are now bouncing around in my head, which means I'm still really mad at Christianity because of the experience that I had with you know, my grandmother divorcing yeah. grandfather, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Which means my animosity grew over the years. I didn't, I didn't begin to hate Christians. That's, that's not the right. I began to hate the idea of Christianity itself. If that mm -hmm. makes more sense. Yeah, it makes perfect it sense. Yeah. It wasn't fair to hate people. I was learning that by being in the goth crowd, that it's right to accept people for who they are. I learned that from them. And as time grew and I got into my 20s, I had found an occult bookstore. Well, it was more of a pagan bookstore in Salem, but the particular guy that was running it at the time was an occultist himself. And I'd go there and we'd talk 20, 30, 40 minutes once a week and pointed me in the direction of a handful of books. And I mm. began to learn about people like Crowley, Alistair Crowley. I learned again, we began to learn about people like uh, Henry Cornelius Agrippa. He's a, I want to say 16th century, fifth, he wrote in the 1500s, a uh, cultist. I learned about these two guys, uh, Dr. John D. and Edward Kelly. They, uh, they were scryer magicians for Queen Elizabeth I. I was learning all, all manner of things, and I began to find this idea of a structured occultism, uh, a structured esoteric practice more to my liking. It made more sense to me. And in doing so, I began to research particularly the, the magic that Aleister Crowley seemed to like the most. And that opened me to the world of, of demons. But in his particular mindset, demons were a way to unlock parts of your own consciousness to clear your mind. Mm -hmm. I usually explain it like this when we read when we read a fiction novel the fiction novel is filled with characters main characters antagonists it's filled with random bartenders or people on the street but every character that's named in this sense would be a personality of your own and what you do in the Crowley style occultism is you personally kill each of those personalities. Mm -hmm. And what's left is a pure self, your pure self, which means you're able to do the will of the universe. Hey, BT, the well, what, what, what was uh, Crowley's uh, method or, or, method of magic called i know he spelled it with a k like magic but it's not oto that's just the organization he was a part of what what is the magic called yeah i can give you a small background it's easier to kind of yeah run yeah that do through. that okay yeah so alistair crowley was born in the 1800s and he was born into a christian group known as the plymouth brethren they're a pretty strict christian group mm -hmm. um i do believe his father died when he was young and he took his money and he basically went around the world and spent all the money that his father left him pretty quick over the next like 30 years. Mm -hmm. He was prolific. He got in contact with this guy, Westcott, and met this guy named McGregor Mathers, and they were part of the Golden Dawn. And the Golden Dawn's an occult uh, gentleman's club. Mm -hmm. That's how I, it's a, and it's an occult gentleman's club. And then he rose through the ranks. It's a tiered system, much like the Freemasons. And eventually he forms his own lodge, and he calls it the Order Templi Orientis, OTO. And then he has a higher up stage, which is called the Silver Star, mm -hmm. Argentum Astrum, or some Astrum Argentum. Gentum. I'm not really good with all the Latin words. They're obsessed with them. And his... His magic focused on breathing techniques. Uh, that's uh, prana, 
yoga. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, focusing on breathing and slowing your breathing and clearing your mind, pretty much Eastern esotericism. And he was also very big in the uh, practice of taking magic, the, the practice of the occult, occultist, and making it into a science. So he, he would call it magic is the, the method of science by the means of religion. And you would take a ritual, formulized step by step by step, and you would follow it, and you would get the same result every time if you were doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. Basically, his aim was to scientificify <laughs> the, the world of the occult. Hmm, and open up, open up a means and a methods for people to pick up a book and do whatever the goal is. Yeah, that sounds a lot like Theosophy and uh, Blavatsky, who came later. I guess they based probably a lot of their stuff on him, that real systematic way of doing the occult, I suppose, right? Well, well Theosophy, no, Theosophy was early on. Uh, theosophy led to a lot of other beliefs in, in, in uh, religious practices. I don't, I don't know. Blavatsky was late 18, was concurrent. She was a, basically a peer of Crowley, and I don't know if they've ever interacted, but hmm. historically speaking, their, their lives run parallel in different parts of the world. No, theosophy leads to Ariosophy, which, is a, which basically led to Nazism hmm. in Germany. That's uh, Guido von List. Yeah, uh, really influenced people like uh, Rudolf von Sabatendorf, right? Some major major occult players in the world of basically early early Germanic pre World yeah. War One, post World mm. War One. Yeah, I've heard world. a list. I've heard a list before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Sabatendorf. Sabatendorf. Basically, he like steals an airplane and he flies to Scotland and he's gonna uh, declare peace. Or something like that. That's what he says. But he also wants to go and duel Al Alistair Crowley. Hmm. Magically wants to duel him like uh, Harry Potter and and uh, that, that the one who Vol shall not be named, Voldemort. Yeah, yeah. He would yeah. Go duel these guys in the the plains of Scala. It, it's quite an amusing and tragic story, to be honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. But all these all these things. This is what I'm learning, and I'm I'm learning these. I'm learning about the people. I'm learning about what they write. I'm learning the practice. And I was drawn heavily towards, I mentioned of earlier, Dr. John D. and Edward Kelly. And these two guys, John D. is a mathematician in the 1500s. He becomes uh, Queen Elizabeth I's uh, court magician. And he is the first one known as the spy 007. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's a, I think that's where James Bond kind of comes from. But anyways, he practices this system of magic and he needs to get a guy who can see through the seer stone. Uh, we, we would call it like a crystal ball. It's the most familiar for a lot of people, you know, looking into the crystal ball. This is actually a mirror, a dark mirror you would practice. And I picked up the idea that you could scry other worlds and other things through a dark mirror. And John Dee and Edward Kelly, they start to scry and they start getting uh, communication from beings that call themselves angels. And they write an entire new language that is grammatically and systematically, linguistically a new language from these mm. angels that they are receiving these messages from interesting and i found that quite intriguing because at the same time i was also looking into say extraterrestrial entities it's pretty interested in and aliens to growing up and this idea of angelic beings talking to these two magicians in the 1500s smack very similar to communications that other people receive through time from entities from outer space or you know i mean like heaven's gate we had the heaven's gate 
thing happened in the yeah. late 90s. I was in, you I'm, know. Yep. I remember that. Yep. That was, you know, part of Apple, my teenage years. Apple, yeah. Apple White, Apple Gate. Same. Apple something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same. I, I can I, still remember seeing that comet up in the sky around yeah. that time. It was the really Hale cool. Bop. Hale the Hale Bop. Bop. Yeah. I, all I remember is the, the bunk beds with them in the black and all you see is their titty shoes. Yeah. And that it's like burned into my head, you know. <laughs> it was a pretty, so, pretty horrible. Yeah, everybody yeah. drank the Kool Aid, Jim Jones style, right? Yep. And and as I'm traveling through this mental world of the occult and studying and learning as much as I can, I'm also practicing at the same time. I'm getting the candles together. I'm getting the the ritual items together. I'm learning that. Things can be substituted for other things. You don't need a sword. You can use a knife. You don't need to use a knife. You can use a pencil. I mean, there's all these. The intention is the brain, the imag. I don't like using the word imagination. I prefer to use the word imaginal. Mm hmm. Why is that? Why, 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 why well, do you say that? Okay. So there was this. There was this Islamic scholar, his name is Henry Corbin, and he created the word imaginal because it, it represents this trained use of the mm. imagination to access higher states of consciousness yeah, and higher okay. dimensions of being. So Makes sense. So when we think of imagination, we're like children. We imagine that spider-man is real and we pretend as we run around the yard being spider-man or superman or batman or we're a princess or this or that and that's imagination mm -hmm. but henry corbin is this you know scholar this islamic scholar and he's like no there needs to be a separation between that and the ability to focus now and reach higher states of consciousness. All right. Well, let me, let me, I'm going to ask you this. Is there a place for the imagination in the Christian world? You know, I'm sure you have an answer to that. And I want to engage that, but I want you to keep telling your story and we'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. In, in the Christian world, give you something here. In the Christian world, we pay attention more to the logos, to a reason. Yeah. Uh, reason through, you know, faith through reason or reasoning through faith, et cetera. And that's, right. that's logos. And what happens is, is there's this conflict between logical thinking and the psyche and the imaginal. And the way that I talk about it is I use the, once again, I have been learning about Plato when I was a teenager. And what mm -hmm. struck with me, and this is the example I use, is the, uh, the cave. Plato has this story about the cave. Yeah. And you have these people, and they're chained in such a way that they can only see the wall in front of them. And upon the wall are shadows that are being cast by a fire behind them that they don't know exists. They don't know there's a fire. They don't know it's a fire. And all they see is puppets on the wall. And that, that is. This, there'll be a puppet of a, an elephant or whatever shows. And it's like, that's an elephant. And you're like, oh, okay, that's an elephant. But what happens is, in the world of reason alone, you buy into whatever you're told. There's no faith mm -hmm. yet. You don't have faith in the things. So you experience them with other people, group experience. You break from the shackles. You climb out of the cave. You have to get used to the new sunlight, and then you find out that an elephant is a three-dimensional thing, not just a two-dimensional black shadow on the wall. That would be the difference between logic alone and the use, the incorporation of the imaginal. Mm. You understand? Yes. Yes. Well, I had begun to take that and incorporate some of these ideas with uh, with Alistair Crowley, and he was big on uh, one of the books I had found is this uh, Lesser Key of Solomon, and it turns out that it's a book on summoning demons, 
and they're named. I mean, they've got whatever their names are. I don't need to go into all that. Well, but, uh, how, but let me ask you this. I mean, this is, uh, I, want, I want to ask you if, if this is a myth or if there is some reality to this. Now, I don't want to mention names or anything, but is there something true? I just watched uh, the movie The Pope's Exorcist with Russell Crowe, and I, I thought, at least my experience with the demonic, it, it, was, it was pretty accurate in, in a lot of ways. But the whole, the whole premise in there is that once you find out an entity's name, you have control or power over them. Now, is that true in the occult world, or is that just a myth? Yes and no. It's a both and. Okay. In the, in the, no. I'll get into the demons a little bit more here in a minute. Okay. I really do okay. want to talk about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, what, one of the major things with the demonic is that if you are coming at it as from a Crowleyite worldview, you're going to say the demons are darker parts of your own personality and you need to slay them. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's if you're coming at it from that worldview. However, when you come into deep depression, like I did, real dark suicidal depression, right? You're, you open yourself to a vulnerable period of time where demons can gain permission footholds or rights over your life. Open doors and, is what we call them. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. the demonic, they're very legalistic. They yep. follow a rule of law that is almost uncomprehensible to the human mind. Hmm. And when you start giving the demonic permission over your life, they start to control parts of your life. Okay. Yeah, it's always fascinating to me that the, the demons are the like the Pharisees of Pharisees, basically. <laughs> They're all about the law and the technicalities and the loopholes that come with it. Yes. Well, yeah. there, with, with, there's a reason why Jesus calls them, you know, you are of your father, the devil. I mean, we take that as a euphemism, but what if it's not as, as, as euphemistic as, it, as it, it appears? I mean, I don't know if y'all thought about that or not. Um, Could you rephrase that question, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, I mean, what Jesus says at one point that, that to the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and we usually take that as euphemistic. Well, what if it's not as euphemistic as... Uh, as as it appears to be, in the sense of, uh, the Pharisees are very super legalistic, and they got that from their father, the devil. You know, does that make sense now? That makes more sense. I appreciate you yeah, rephrasing yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Well, so, typically, the demons a person like me or anybody is going to interact with are lesser entities. They're not going to be dealing with Satan or his uh. What, what I call the, the, his five generals, the leaders of the table, they're going to be dealing with very lesser entities that are trying to gain clout in hell. Mm -hmm. and well, let me ask you, well, well, let me ask you this too. I'm sorry I keep interrupting you, but I, I, uh, do you distinguish between the Nephilim unclean spirit type demons versus the demons that are more what we would call Elohim or angelic or... Can you kind of sort all that out for us? I appreciate that question. I, I, do have, I do have a different view than some of my individuals that are members of my own particular religion. I view that there are fallen angels that have, that are big named fallen angels. You know, we have mm -hmm. Michael, the, the archangel. We have Gabriel, the archangel. Uh, Raphael, the archangel, for example. Mm -hmm. This means that we're going to have named fallen angels like Satan or Asmodeus or Belial or Baal or Moloch. These are going to be, these are named fallen angels that fell with Satan. But then at the same time, we have individual demons that are the unclean or quote unquote bastard spirits of the Nephilim. That's the, that's the spirit that was infused with the children that 
our birth from the fallen angels and the human women. We got the, right. the Nephilim of old, right? And yeah. their, their spirits are obviously not created by, you know, humans, we, our spirit's created by God. Right. You know, right. the, the, angel, the, the angel before it fell was, crea- was a spirit and it was created by God. But now you have an entity that's birthed from this spirit and the human, and now you have a spirit that's not made by God. You have, uh, I do believe, a gigas or gigantes in the Greek can also mean earthborn as opposed mm-hmm. to heavenborn, which is what our spirits are. Mm-hmm. And those are, those are the, I prefer to call them the demons and then call the, the big, big shot satan types the fallen ones yeah yeah, as my my definition yeah and and there's really five i can get into the the five generals and and talk about how they've impacted our culture and kind of talk about that for a minute if you want yeah go there yeah please okay yep so this this is research that has been brought out through and you, you talked about like the Pope's exorcist. It's not exactly a very accurate movie, but at least it gets the message and the information out there. Uh, the way the demons interact with people is more along the lines of what uh, is shown in the movie Nefarious. Yeah. That was a much better portrayal of what demonic possession is. Anyways, the five generals of Satan, these are fallen angels. And right, right below Satan is this one called Baal. And uh, Baal's a, he, he's a entity of uh, impurity. I mean, Satan is the, the, the lord of impurity, but Baal is also this uh, entity of impurity. Mm-hmm. And he's, this, he's the beginning of this influence. You know, if, if, the, if he begins to get his influence in a, in a country, he, he begins to institute uh, free love. Mm. Do what you want to do. Make love to who you want to make love to, et cetera, uh, or or pursue your own dreams at whatever cost. Mm. Self, he's like the the king of self fulfillment desires. You know, selfish self fulfillment desires. Very Dionysian, much like a Dionysian. Dionysian. Yeah, that's a good way yeah. of looking at it. And yeah. then after uh, Baal comes is an entity called Asmodeus, and Asmodeus is a is another one of those named fallen angels. And he's specific. He's the one in uh, Tobit. Right. Sorry, I interrupt you. That's yeah. okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, he's found in the book of Tobit, if you want to find a biblical yeah. reference. And, yeah. And he's the demon of uh, same-sex attraction in men. Okay. And so he begins to influence and bring this kind of thing into the world or into the, the culture that he's invited into. And then what happens then as he brings his two buddies, and his two buddies are Leviathan, and this is a fallen angel, but he's a masculine, uh, same-sex attraction, so he, he brings the masculine kind of same-sex attraction, whatever that is, and mm-hmm. then follows with that as the one known as Lilith. And this is the mm-hmm. same-sex attraction in women. Mm-hmm. And so we get... We get these guys, they all come together. You know, Baal comes and then Asmodeus, Leviathan, Lilith. They all just, they're like a trilogy, a trinity kind of thing. They, they come together and they, they influence at the same time. And then the last one that comes, he changes his name culture to culture. And today we call, we call this angel Baphomet. That's what we call him today. That's how he identifies today as Baphomet. And one of his more famous names that people are going to recognize is the name of Moloch. He was Moloch mm. in the Old Testament. And mm-hmm. so if I were to give, hey, you know, I said these, these fallen angels are really influencing our culture. Well, what, what kind of evidence do you have for that? And I says, well, look, when Baal comes and he brings this do whatever you want to do mentality, at the same time, we get the free love movement in the United States. So the yeah. 60s. Okay. 60s, yep. And then what happens right after that is m- people are pushing for uh, same-sex marriages. People are they're, they're working on that, but Roe v. Wade comes, and that's abortion, mm-hmm. child sacrifice. 
and it all begins to fall apart. And these are the, the ones that deal with those entities are typically the leaders and the rulers that we've elected. Those offices are the ones these angels, these fallen ones are called to influence. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a common person like me who may interact with this lesser known demon that is an imp, if you will, some kind of small little goblin, not, nothing really big. You know, that, that amazes me, BT, because it seems like to me, if there is a divine council worldview, that there also is a cosmic hierarchy in the dark world as well. And you just described that same principle, which we know from the scriptures there is, because they were in charge of different nations. But I find that really interesting. And, and what the other thing I find really interesting is everything you just named started in the 1960s or late 50s, early 60s. And, and that just blows me away uh, how the door was opened in that time period. I mean, I'm not saying that Satan didn't have anything to do with America before that or, you know, but but it, 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 it appeared that that was the turning point in our, our country, so to speak, to begin to that downward slide to where we are now. Absolutely. I mean... If we were to go back, let's put our tinfoil hats on for a moment. If we were to go back and we were to look at the 60s, not, not merely are we dealing with, you know, this free love movement. Right. Uh, the late 40s, 50s, we get, there's an operation called Operation Paperclip, where we're taking Nazi scientists and Nazi occultists, yeah. and we're taking them into our country. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor von Braun, for example, uh, is a, was a Nazi scientist, but he was also an occultist. We get, yeah, we actually we actually had a. Uh, I'm learning about this right now. I have to share this. We actually had a Nazi base in Los Angeles, California, in the back of Laurel Canyon in the woods, back back in the 40s, where they would bring in Nazis in this base, and they lived and and did experiments and all this stuff. This was all going on, and they were waiting for the end of the world, and then they were going to repopulate with their Aryan type thing. I mean, a lot of people don't know about that. It didn't even really come out for sure until, I want to say, the 80s or 90s or something. But yeah, I mean, there it is right there, Operation Paperclip in, in Los Angeles, California, which is one of the cultural centers of our country. And they're playing with, we're, they're playing with spirits and forces that brought our ancestors technology. Yeah. Um, and now, typically, you're going to hear a different probably a different opinion on this. However, I believe the fallen angels, they brought mankind an understanding on how to make weapons better. I mean, I'm mm. pretty sure that, you know, man could make a knife or make a, but he probably didn't make a sword until the fallen angels taught them how to do that. Yeah. So a man invented the bow and the arrow way before a sword, which means that whatever technology these angels brought was definitely designed to kill more humans, which seems to be the goal of these guys. Mm -hmm. They really don't like us, but I, I will, I, I'll rabbit trail into this one for a minute and we're going to, right after Project Paperclip, we start getting government experiments in psychedelics or, or mm. chemical medicines like, uh, LSD, for example. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Yep. You got it. And we get Project MK Ultra. And that's designed to manipulate the human consciousness to do whatever the CIA wanted it to do. But beyond that, we have the Montauk Project. And the Montauk Project began in the late 40s where, whether this is true or not true, they managed to get a ship uh, to disappear, to basically leave time and space for a moment and come back. I, I think they called that the Philadelphia Experiment. And that, yeah, that could yep. be followed up, anyone who wants to look that up. Yeah. But the Montauk Project was also out of a place, I do believe it's New York. And these guys are underground, and they are the men who stare at goats. That's the movie reference for people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you get this guy, there's a story of a guy who said that he could, he could psychically see anything anywhere at any time and do influence and 
they pull this guy in and they says, okay, I want you to influence this seismic meter. It's buried here. It's underneath the concrete. And we want you to move the needle. And he moves the needle quite a bit, more than a, a regular tremor would have done. And so they buy into that this guy is a real psychic dude. They began using people like this to spy on the Russians. So it goes all the way through to the Cold War. This remote project. viewing. Remote right, viewing. remote. Yeah. You got it. And, and this is all through using things like deprivation tanks and higher-end occult experiments designed to open the mind to the other dimensional realm and to move mm. minds through, through space and time. And these are the powers that the occult world can bring to people when you have the abilities to do so. And it usually takes quite a bit of money to do a lot of these things. A person's not going to be able to pick up some kind of pagan Wiccan book and suddenly find themselves in a storage facility in Russia, for example. But there was another project that comes out of the Montauk experiment, and that's the N1X project. And that was in the 80s, and it was designed to give the American government access to materials, classified documents, and materials that the Russians were inventing at the same time for, you know, whatever MIGs or whatever the United States would have been interested in, weapons, et cetera, of course. Wow. And it's, and it's all through the, I, I bring it up because we're talking about the use of psychedelics to open the mind to other states of consciousness, right? Right. And it, and it harkens back to these shamanistic practices of our ancients. Mm -hmm. to open, open the mind and open the world or open your cultural environment to the forces that are unseen. I call them sinister forces because they really don't have humans' best interest at heart. Right, right. Anyway, so in, in, in my journey, we'll get back to that for a minute. In my journey, this is what I'm dealing with. Uh, learning about these experiments, learning about how, how to talk to the demons and how to summon them in a ritualistic way using summoning circles. And I'm never, I understand that I'm not ever going to be able to talk to any of the higher lords in Fell, but, you know, I try my darndest to talk to some lower, lower level demons. And I use the, the means and methods that are laid, laid out in, in the Golden Dawn or even in some of these uh, diaries that are left from Crowley in uh, his book, Vision and the Voice. At the same time, I'm learning... Have you guys, have you guys heard of, of the Enneagram? Are you guys familiar with that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know it's, much about it. Well, it's it was all the rage a few weird years ago. Well, okay. yeah, it's, ma it's made major inroads into the Christian community, and, and I've often wondered... Because I, I enjoy studying like how people are wired, and I started reading about it and looking at it, and then I said, no, 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 there's something wrong with this. So, yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. Okay, so there's a guy, he's a mystic in the 1900s. His name is G.I. Gurdjieff. And like I said, a lot of these guys are all concurrent with each other. This is all interesting, just spawning at the same time in, mm -hmm. in the world. Jai Gurdjieff, he, he uh, is a mystic, and he creates this system of thought called the Fourth Way, and it's outside of Christianity, and it's more of a, it's more of a pan, panentheistic, not a pantheistic, and that's, so if I was to, I'm going to have to sidetrack here, panentheism yeah. is like thinking of the universe, the whole universe is a big living thing, kind of like a giant tree. And the tree represents everything in the universe. I mean, the people, animals, planets, everything. But it okay. also says there's something even bigger, like the roots of the Ooh. tree that go deep into the ground. This something bigger is like a spiritual divine presence that's connected to everything in the universe. But it's also beyond the universe. So the... So the... the uh, sorry, clarify. The, yeah, so the... Pan and in theism, it's, it's like God... 
the the creation is in God, but God is bigger than the creation. Right. It's but it's it's both the idea of God and the idea of the universe being interconnected. Okay. Okay. This yeah. isn't this isn't G. Edgar Chief. This is the fourth way, and he gets with this guy uh, named Opensky, and Opensky is a automatic writer. Uh, this is somebody who channels the spiritual world, and he is influenced, inspired by the other realm to write unconsciously. Mm. And what he writes, you know, he doesn't know what he writes. Until he's done writing, and then he reads it and goes, oh, I wrote that. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Mm. And what Opensky does is Opensky takes this thing that Gurdjieff created, this Enneagram, and he ascribes to it the seven sins. And anybody who's familiar with the Enneagram will go, wait a minute, there's nine points. There's nine points on the Enneagram. Absolutely. Obensky had to create two more sins. So he basically takes the seven capital sins and he adds, makes two more. And I, on the fly, I can't name those off. So Obensky takes this idea and he ascribes the sins to it. And he also ascribes some virtues and creates new virtues. So two more virtues. He got seven virtues, seven sins, plus two, plus two. And he takes this and he brings it to San Francisco. And it's the 70s. Everything's coming to the United States in the 70s. I mean, we're talking uh, mm -hmm. Buddhistic thought, Vedantic thought. It's all coming to San Francisco. The Enneagram comes to San Francisco. There's a handful of famous, famous people in the world that if I name like Richard Rohr, will mm -hmm. we'll be familiar. I mean, this guy was a Franciscan priest and he, he studies the Enneagram. Well, there's another guy, uh, Father Mitch Pacwa, who some listeners, if they listen to Catholic radio, might be familiar with, he gets involved in this. And they take it back to their parts of the world and they teach. Well, the thing was, is you had to go to a class on how to teach the Enneagram before you could teach the Enneagram. And it was kind of a way to generate funds for an area. So basically, Catholic churches were making money getting people to come and learn about the Enneagram. So mm. it was everywhere. It's, it, it's in everybody's basement. It's spreading like wildfire. It's spreading, it's spreading more than the, the Ouija board once Hasbro started producing it. I mean, it's, it's going everywhere through the fire. And, and ultimately, today, when we see the Enneagram, we're going to look at it. It's a personality chart, and it's basically a way to identify somebody's personality traits. You can go, oh, that person's this kind of person, that person, I'm this kind of person. And it's different than looking at it as the Jungian way, but probably point of my, mm -hmm. what I'm talking about is, is the mains and methods and scope was sent to a man named Opensky through automatic writing. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. everything he gleaned, he gleaned it, he gleaned this technology through the spirits that are a part of that sinister force. Mm -hmm. There's no way a good angel does this. Right. Not the, you know, that's, that's not their MO. That's, that's not how God works with his, his angels. He doesn't go, oh, go ahead and go down there and influence this man to create a whole new way of identifying pers personalities. No, as a matter of fact, the only time he sends an angel down to do something like that is a lying spirit that he sends down to be in the, the, the mouth of prophets. So it, chances are it probably was not a good, a good angel or a good spirit that he sent down. And good angels and good spirits, when they come down, they manifest themselves to the person and give them the option to either receive or, or, you know, that's why free will is so important. That's the distinction. Whereas the, the fallen ones don't, don't they, they'll just invade your free will, whereas the, the good ones won't invade your free will. Is that a fair assumption, BT? Well, that's the only way automatic writing would work. A good angel would right. never, could, could never right. supersede your free will. It would be a violation of the laws of heaven. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a book, it's called Basil Bub's Tales to His Grandson. And it's a pretty thick book. Uh, the guy himself recommends people read it two or three times before they put it down, you know, before they actually put it away because he believes himself to kind of be this Nietzschean thinker and writer. You know, Nietzsche, Nietzsche would write a sentence and he would basically be saying 10 different sentences at the same time. 
Gurdjieff was a real deep writer, deep thinking writer. Mm-hmm. Anyways, so I'm in my late late twenties, and I've entered into a, into the state of severe depression. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this before yeah, you dive, get up into that. Through all this, and I'm not. A, I do not want to glorify this at all. That's my disclaimer here. But through all this, are you seeing supernatural stuff happen? Through this, or is it just a sham? So, there are some things that I experienced that were shams. Uh, the Wicca experiment experiments were all sham. Uh, yeah, they made me feel good inside, but they didn't do any. Uh, I'm not rich. I don't drive a <laughs> Ferrari. Uh, I named it and claimed it. I tried to blab it and grab it with the occult, and then nothing came. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and basically, law of attraction. <laughs> you got it. It's no, not none of that. None of that ever worked. Well, the thing was, is what did begin to happen was things would go missing in the house. Keys, plates, glasses, silverware. Things would go missing in the house, and they would be found somewhere else that they would never be put. Mm. That was happening. There were unexplainable lights, unexplainable shadows that would move upon their own volition in the room. There were things happening in the environment in which I did my work. Interesting. There were, th- there were things happening. And one of the, one of the mo- more severe evidences of this was the suicidal depression that I went through. Uh, self-cutting, mm. uh, found myself in the hospital because I had passed out from blood loss. And these were all things brought on during a time that I didn't, I of my own mind was, a, was unaware of doing them. Mm. But it was during a time that I was doing some kind of occult practice, trying to summon some kind of demonic entity. I, would, I woke up in the hospital after that from blood loss. The depression, depression got deep and that was most likely an influenced depression. It was a, I was being heavily oppressed by the the demonic forces that I believed I controlled. Right. And that's what led to some very dark times in my life where I was miserable and I didn't have a whole lot going on positive in my life. And what ended up happening was I had gotten myself a job. I was working at a gas station. I was not really taking care of myself. I'd wear, you know, the clean clothes to the gas station, but that was it. I wasn't doing well. I wasn't taking care of myself. And I had begun praying to God because through this time of learning about the occult and understanding that these were fallen angels, they were Nephilim spirits, I was, of course, reading my Bible, but I wasn't reading it in a faith in Jesus kind of way. Uh But he's there, of course. I knew that much as a child. I started praying to God, started asking Jesus to send somebody into my life that would invite me to their church and bring me back, bring me back to God. Mm. And in doing so, I started getting visitation at the gas station from this local seminary. There's a Catholic seminary in in the area I'm at. And these, these seminarians would come through the gas station and they would talk about Jesus. And they would talk about their theology classes. They would talk about philosophy with me. And it became well known amongst fellow students that, hey, you want to get a, a good view on Nietzsche or, or Carl Jung or any of these other philosophers that they're studying, go talk to the guy at the gas station. So I was beginning to, to talk to these guys. And they'd come and they would talk to me for half hours at a time at a gas station. Hmm. Finally, one time... Late at night, I closed the gas station at 10 o'clock at those days, and I'd never get customers between 9.30 and 10. Never. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's crossroads in the middle of nowhere. And I got this one guy. He came through, and he was getting gas, took his card. He was a seminary. He was a, a, an ordained deacon at the time. And I was handing him his receipt, and I says, hey, he goes to me, he goes, I'm going to St. Ed's Catholic Church here in Kaiser. Why don't you come tomorrow? That's all he said. I said, oh, okay, whatever. And he drove off. Well, I, 
He comes through the gas station the following week and says, I didn't see you when I invited you to my church. Why don't you come to my church? St. Ed's, Catholic Church, Kaiser Oregon. Eh. So, okay, this happens one more time, the third time, and he says it again. And he, he's, he doesn't have an attitude. There's no, there's no negative attitude here. Pretty positive guy. And he says it again, and I'm, you know, once again, threes are pretty important in my worldview. At the time, you know, when I was studying all this occult stuff, three met something. Right. So I said, okay, fine. So I went. And I was greeted warmly by him. I was greeted warmly by the, the priest and started talking to people, started talking to regular parishioners and how much they love Jesus and finding out that this, this was a, a, what would we call this? This was a church full of life. There was, you know, it was filled with dead bones, basically. These people were actively participating in the, the mission of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this influenced me enough to, to study and read and research and be taught. And eventually I was, I was baptized into the Catholic Church one month before my 30th birthday. And my grandmother had reminded me that I was, because I was back into good standing with her, that I had made a promise to Jesus that I'd be baptized before I was 30. Uh, here I am baptized now before I'm 30. And, you know, this is 11 years ago now. And that's where I've been since is practicing loving Jesus, doing the things that Jesus commands us to do, and then loving him and loving people. And I'm, and I'm really thankful if I, you know, if I were to go back and go, oh gosh, I'm really thankful for the goth guys the goth crowd teaching me that I, to accept people and love them for who they are. I might not mm. like what they do. I don't like what they do, but that doesn't mean I could take away their dignity as human beings because ultimately yeah. that comes from God. And if it comes from God, therefore I should respect that. Yeah. Well, the enemy kind of overplayed his hand, getting you involved in that. They, they taught you some things that the father used. Um, Unfortunately, that's ironic. Yeah, <laughs> it's how how they work. But I will say one thing, and I and I've heard, I've heard this. I've heard that the fear of the unknown is an irrational response to the excesses of the imagination. But our fear of the, but our fear of the everyday, of the lurking stranger, the sound of footfalls in an empty house, or even the fear of a violent death, and even our primitive impulse to survive are as real as the acceptance that it could happen to any of us. And it's that, yes. it's that idea, that, it's that fear that ultimately drove me into the realms of the darkness. Mm -hmm. And it was the counteraction of fear that is the love of God that pulled me out of it. Wow. Yeah, through his body, for the love of God, through his body, they pulled you in. I mean, even starting out with the seminarians at the gas station, I mean, that was an integral part of God pulling you back to himself. I think that's awesome. Look, we're kind of getting ready to land this plane. And, um, and, and for those of you out there, if you enjoy this, you're going to hear more from BT because we're going to do other episodes where he's going to co-host with us about deep dives into all kinds of just fascinating, interesting stuff. But what I'd like to do with every guest, the first time they're on our show, we usually ask them a question. But before we get to that, um, I'd like for you, if you could take like five minutes, BT, and just tell us your thoughts on discernment when you're in like the fringe in the occultic world. And what are some keys that you use to discern the truth from the thought? I mean, your podcast is, is called Truth and Shadow. And it's coming to a podcast near you soon. <laughs> That's, and right. That's right. It, it, truth and shadow. Yeah, the check the it essence. Out. The essence of that podcast is truth and shadow. So it's discernment. So give me five minutes of your time, if you, if you don't mind, and tell me, uh, you know, what does it mean to discern, and how do you do it? Absolutely, that's a really good question. Let's pull back a little bit. And let's look at some facts in the United States today. The occult has become much more popular than it was when I, 20 years ago when I was really into it. Today, there's popular satanic music. There's satanic street gangs. There's an increase in satanic worship. 
There's a more widespread use of the horoscope, study of the signs of the zodiac, and even more satanically influenced games can be purchased. Mm. Uh, Diablo mm. 4 just came out, which heavily talks about the angel Lilith, the uh, fallen angel Lilith, for example. Mm. That's out there. Lots of people will laugh off the notion of the power of evil as an actual part of this real world we live in. And so I do believe that the demonic influence is very real and it constitutes a dangerous threat to our spiritual well-being. In the letter of Ephesians, Paul tells us, uh, off the top of my head, I'm going to say it's in Ephesians 1, Paul tells us that God chose Jesus, chose us in Jesus Christ before the world began. So yes. we're called to be holy, we're called to be without sin in his sight, and God called us to be his children through Jesus. So in Jesus and through his blood, we have been saved and our sins are forgiven. This is how generous God our Father has been with us. Okay. So the evil one can tempt us, but he cannot touch us directly unless we open that door for him. So we shouldn't fear Satan. We shouldn't be constantly looking for him. We shouldn't be constantly going, oh, that's the, there's footfalls in the house. <laughs> Let's not concentrate on those evil spirits, but fix our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Pareidolia, that's what you taught me, right? Yeah, <laughs> looking for signs and things that are not actually what they are. You know, we'll look at our uh, coat rack over here. It's casting a shadow that looks like a man. Well, unless that shadow moves, you're probably just a, just a shadow. And if it moves, we've got something else going on in the house, and I've experienced shadow people. But anyways, when we discern... When we're talking to people about their experiences, we need to find in ourselves that place of peace that Christ gives us. Jesus gives us peace, not as the world gives, only from the Father. It's our peace. And as we're talking to somebody who has this mindset, and they're truly a practitioner in the demonic arts, they're really working with the sinister forces they're going to put off what I call an energy and they're going to put off an energy that will make them seem narcissistic. And this is usually a sign of demonic influence. Super hyper narcissistic people. Me, 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 me. I, 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 I. And they'll find themselves, you'll, you will find them quite pedantic and pontificating on any kind of whatever is going on without taking a breath sometimes. It's really scary. But in my own personal discernment of looking back over the, this decade into that time, well, two decades really, in this time period when we start interacting with individuals that are truly influenced, by forces that we cannot consciously comprehend. You got to understand, people, these forces do not work like humans at all. When we're influenced and we're faced by these things, we will feel it. We will feel it in our soul. We'll feel it. It'll feel, uh, some people say they'll smell something. Some people will mm. say they hear something. So they'll smell. I don't know, an extreme idea, they'll smell sulfur or they'll hear bells, but they'll hear something that's typically associated with the sinister forces. And I found that to be the most true and most personal experience possible that I can give anyone out there, any of your listeners, that people influenced by the sinister forces feel different in a manner that is not natural. We're not talking about them being off psychologically where it's some kind of mental disorder and you can go, oh, that person's just ADHD or that person's manic depressed. No, these people are, they're not okay. And they need the blood of Jesus more than anything. Mm. Well, let me yeah. ask you this. I mean, this, this kind of goes along. There's a lot of other podcasts out there that will have people on their show 
And, you know, it's like, I've even talked to you about this, BT, and, and Lindsay and I've talked about this too. It's like, um, and I'm not discrediting these podcasts. A lot of them are podcasts that I enjoy and I love. But it's just like, there, there's almost this, this sensational, like, people come out of the woodwork that I have a story and I was ex cult and I was an ex-witch and I was an ex-whatever. And, 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 and sometimes it just doesn't ring true, BT. It's like, you know, it's like when I ask you to be on here, um, you did this with reticence because I mean, this is not stuff you just want to share all over everywhere or whatever. I mean, you don't brag about the fact that you were in the occult yeah. or anything. I mean, it took me a while to even know that you were involved in it, in our friendship. And so, I mean, what do you have to say about that? What do you think about that? I, I believe that people have a lot of subjective experience. Mine was subjective. It is quite personal. Yeah. Uh, up until it was influencing things in the house. Yeah, that, you know, that was quite real. And until people are able to be vulnerable with the truth, they are simply regurgitating a word vomit. And that's what I like to call it, word vomit. Um, yeah. That, that has come from maybe something they've read, somebody they've talked to something they've heard on another podcast and they're merely regurgitating that information as if it was personal. And there are people out there that do this and it doesn't, it could be anything. I mean, it's a, it's a thing. People talk about interesting things that have happened to them, but never did because it makes them seem interesting. And I really don't like talking about the past and i've skirted over a lot of the darker things that have happened right because it dredges up memories and it dredges up stuff that scared me so much that i've pushed it out of my mind mm -hmm. so far well it's not really out of my mind i mean it's it's you there compartmentalized it, but yeah. it's but it's pushed into a place and so it's pushed into a dark corner under lock and key because I became a person that is not okay, was not okay to be around, was not okay to know. And that was not an okay time. But what, do you think, BT, that, that a lot of people out there are what we would call dabblers and they exaggerate their involvement in the occult and to, like you said, to get the attention? And I had a buddy that healing ministry and and i don't agree with this but he used to say psychologically that the person who had sra and the person who had alien abductions were psychologically the same and they were attention seekers well i i don't believe that because there's it's fundamentally not true there's too many people that have had abductions and have had an sra type that are entirely different like wirings entirely different uh, personality types and all that kind of stuff so i don't believe that but but I do wonder sometimes though if there are uh, people that that uh, you know dabble and and they think that that's the extent of it and I don't think they realize how deep you can go like you did in the occult. Yes, there are individuals out there who can play in the puddles of the occult. There are people who can splash around in the shallow end of the pool. And never get into anything deeper. Yes, absolutely. But the deep, the, the stuff that's in the deep lurks itself into the shadow, into the shallower parts yeah. of the pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand that any of its tentacles could reach out and grab you and pull you in. Mm. So absolutely. There are individual, the, uh, sorry, that's satanic ritual abuse, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, there are individuals out there that can have what's known as disassociative disorder. That's yeah, uh, DID. Yeah. Yes, DID. That's a that's in the uh, the 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 man. So the DSM, the, the the manual for that mental disorders. Yeah, there I are, forget the newest manual. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a DSM fifty million. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are there are experts, psychology experts, in the realm that deals with. Uh, 
exorcism. I mean, you you brought up you know the Pope's exorcist. That was Malachi Martin, right. wasn't it, or Father yeah. Amorth? Father Amorth. Yeah, Father Amorth was an exorcist. There's another guy, Malachi Martin. He was an exorcist. There's a handful of guys. Anyways, there are guys that are psychologists. There's a priest. His name is Father Chad Ripperger, and he he um what a name. He, right. He mm. he studied psychology for a long time, and he even wrote a couple of books on the psychology of the demonic. Because they have an MO, they have a modus operandi, they, they behave yeah. in a specific way. Well, that makes sense. They have a soul. So, I mean, I guess they have a soul or a spirit or they, ha they have they a, are a, 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 yeah, they have a thinking capacity and therefore they can be analyzed is yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yes, they are an intellect. Intellects can be yes. analyzed. They are an intellect. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, doing so, you can also then understand what the particular, I mean, I don't agree with. His premise on what demons versus fallen angels, I don't agree with that. However, right. it's neither here nor there. I do agree that he did a systematic study of their intellect and the ability to understand that things operate in a cascading manner. The snowball gets bigger as it falls down the hill. Mm, and yeah. individuals who play in the shallow end can get themselves pretty deep. So I, yeah. I typically caution people, you know, hey, reading the, the, the Sunday newspaper's horoscope may seem like all fun and games until it gets serious. Uh, grabbing the Ouija board might seem like fun and games until stuff goes missing in the house. Yeah. Um, yeah. And by then it's actually too late. You've opened up a gateway to the other realm that has rights to your soul. And mm -hmm. you have to work with Jesus on that. All right. Well, BT, I want to wrap it up here, but uh, this is the question that we ask usually at the end of the show. Can you tell us, if possible, if it's not too private or one that it, it is not private, uh, what is the most supernatural experience that you've had since you've come to Christ, since you've been converted? The most supernatural experience that I've had since I've come to Christ? Yes. Oh, that, that's a pretty good question. Have I even had a supernatural experience? No, that'd be an unfair statement. I, yeah, you, you have. I, have. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I believe in miracles every day. Uh, the most supernatural thing that I've ever experienced since coming to Christ. Oh, I'll go, I'll go one that's kind of an interesting one. Um, I was driving to the coast, and we've got some really windy roads that go over the mountain passes. And I was taking a pass that was to take about 15 miles off of my commute to the coast. And here you go. Uh, I'm, I'm driving my car. I'm pretty confident in its ability for traction control on the roads. It's kind of a little sports car, uh, sports equipped car. And it, it can handle tight curves at pretty high speed. And... I'm driving this and I'm just taking my curves and I'm just driving long as arrogant as a, as a kid, you know, I'm in my thirties and the back end begins to spin out from behind, you know, from behind me, basically, you know, I'm driving the car and the back end begins to fishtail out. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, and it's, it still scares me enough. It scared me because it's weird. Uh, the car, the, the tail end of the car hit something hard and it straightened it back out. And I describe it that way because as the tail begins to fishtail out and the car is trying to do its traction control stuff on its own and the road's slippery. And so I've lost friction with the road and the tail end swine, but it, it hits something. As it slides, it hits something real hard. Bam! And it straightens the car out, and I didn't go off the cliff. Like, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. we're talking hundreds of feet of a drop. But it's as if, you know, my car hit one of those, those guardrails, but there's no guardrail. And so I don't mm -hmm. know what my car hit. And when I, when I, you know, I come to a stop, and I get out, and I look at my car because I'm like, I hit something, right? There's no sign mm -hmm. of damage on my car. There's no sign of anything. And I knew 
in my mind that I was going to tail off that cliff and I was just going to be gone. And all I remember saying was, sweet Jesus. That's it. Something stopped mm. my car from falling off the cliff. And that's probably the most supernatural thing that has ever happened since I became a Christian. Wow. Mm. I mean, that's, that sounds angelic if, I, if I've ever heard something. It's like yeah. it just stopped you, and there was no damage on the car, was there? No damage on the car, no nothing. Well, they say never yeah. drive faster than your guardian angel can fly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sandy says that hers is truth and mercy, and they follow her all the days of her life. <laughs> <laughs> so she keeps them busy. Believe me, I do too. But uh, yeah, that was that was an awesome story. Thanks, BT, for, yeah. for telling us that. And uh, thanks for taking your time to, to be on the show and just to give us a, a kind of a primer or primer on the occult and, 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 and your journey and your testimony and all that kind of stuff. I love testimonies and, and everything. And Well, yeah, and yours was like equal parts, just giving us knowledge and a good testimony. I think we got we got both of that with this yeah. this episode it was really good yeah. thank you yeah. you're welcome and we're looking forward to diving into some more topics with you as a co-host so we can't wait yep. for that um we have some stuff in the works you guys out there some really interesting archaeological stuff we will see you again bye guys Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.